Brian, we talked about having this one guest early on when we decided to do the show. And let's be real. We finally got our wish come true. I mean, he's arguably, I mean, we talk about it to us. He is the best 140 pounder in boxing right now. But we just had him on the show and he gave us a lot of time. A lot of time. And our guest was arguably the best 140 pounder in the world. WBC super lightweight champion Regis Progray, who was at the top of our list in terms of desired guests. <laughs> Uh, when we were building out who we wanted to get on the show. Uh, we've already gotten a couple from that list, so that's great. But Regis Program was very high up there. So without further ado, let's get into it. One of our best conversations so far. He was very gracious with his time. Here's on the latest episode of The Mandatory with Brian and Chantel, Regis Program. <laughs> Hey, what's up? Welcome back to The Mandatory. We got a very special guest rocking with us today. Also, big shout out to Fight Hype and Fan Sided. But today we got arguably the number one boxer in the 140 pound division. He holds the WBC Super Light and he has 28 wins, 24 of those coming by way of knockout. One of the best to ever do it out of New Orleans and one of the best Southpaws in boxing as well. We got Regis Proge rocking with us. Regis, thank you so much for joining us today. No problem. No problem. Thanks for having me. Obviously, you know, you were actually, when we started deciding we wanted to do this show, you were number one on our list. We were like, we got to get Regis pro grade for sure. True story. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you're <laughs> honestly like you're, I mean, I'm not trying to gas you up here, but you're both of our like favorite boxes. You're on that list, but I actually want to go back yeah. and, you know, talk about your upbringing a little bit. Uh, you know, you're originally mm. from new Orleans and of course you had to move during the time of hurricane Katrina out to Houston. Tell me what that right. experience for you was like, um, you know, how that kind of changed you as a person. Um, the, I mean, one of the, one of the main things that changed me as a person, it was like, don't be materialistic, you know? And, um, so right before Hurricane Katrina hit, it was, you know, it, it happened in August. So before that, of course, the summertime and in the summertime I worked for, you know, I, I used to work and stuff like that to make some money and I worked to get some brand new Prada shoes. You know, I don't know if y'all Prada, Prada, you know, the, the, the name brand Prada, right? And yeah. Prada's was a big thing back in New Orleans. And I worked, you know, I worked for, you know, someone to get some Prada's and stuff like that. That's what everybody kind of was wearing at the time. And I remember, man, I had them Prada's and um, I left them. I, I, I didn't bring the Prada's with me. I left them, um, I left them in, in New Orleans and, you know, basically, you know, all that, like I, I had just got them. I left them and then a storm hit and it was gone. And not only, and I mean, that's just something small, the Prada shoes and stuff like that, but literally like everything could be taken away from you in a, in a second, you know? And that's why, like, that's how now I'm, I'm just not materialistic. Like I literally, I mean, it's nothing like for me, it's nothing nobody can take away from me, you know, like besides like my nothing materialistic you know the only thing that i really care about is things in this office right now is like my pictures and my books but you know i got a real big house and bro, this house get knocked down and i can get another one you know i can get everything else you know so it's like for me the memories the pictures my, my books my boxing dvds that's the only thing that i really care about so i'm just um that's what it, like hurricane katrina told me just don't be don't be materialistic and um because like i said when you when we went back to that we was when we went back, we was like some of the first people in the in the East. I'm from New Orleans East, and basically, um, we went back because my cousin stayed on the West Bank, and they they got the they had um access into the city because they lived on the West Bank, and so you know they told us how to go around certain things and how to go, and you know we went and man, just seeing a neighborhood like that, seeing our house like it's crazy. It's it just it's it's so it's scary what water can do, like just just yeah. water. And it just pushed everything around. Like our house was like everything was just all all around. Like our stuff that was in the kitchen was a living room. Stuff that was in my room was you know somewhere else. It was just crazy. The couches was flipped over. TV was flipped over. Refrigerators flipped over. It was just it was it was scary. It's crazy and scary to see that. You know I saw like house. I saw houses, full houses, get moved just from the water like a house was picked up and you see the slab and then you look down the street and you saw that's that house you know and just seeing those type of things it just it just made me like um just not materialistic and 
you know, and then of course moving to Houston, it just put me on a whole different, it, it put my mindset on a whole different thing because in New Orleans, most people like that, that I came up with, most people that live in New Orleans and from New Orleans, they've been there their whole life. They, they mama's and, and, and daddy's been there their whole life. They grandma and grandpa been there their whole life. They great, great grandpa and, and, and have been there their whole life. So, um, you know, we don't see nothing else. And when I came to Texas, when I came to Houston, it was just like it was a it was a shock, a culture shock, because I went to like in in, in my high school in New Orleans, like oh, I think we had like I think 500 people in the school, something like that. Like everybody kind of knew everybody. And that's how it is in New Orleans. The city is like that. Everybody kind of knows everybody in New Orleans. But I came here. I came. I, I graduated. I actually went to five high schools because of the storm. But I graduated out here in Texas, and man, like I, it was like five thousand people in a high school out here. So it was just a, it was a huge culture shock. You got people that they from countries. Like I had people in my class that was from countries I never even knew existed. In New Orleans, you know, you know everybody. You know, you you, you know generation generation after generation. So it's not. And it's not big. It's not that big of a deal. But when I came here, it was just like a culture shock. It just really opened my eyes that the world is way, way bigger. And you know, and then just Houston as a whole. Houston is one of the most diverse cities in in the country. And I'm just, I'm so glad that I got to immerse myself in this culture. Yeah, and you know, it's kind of crazy because I feel like Houston was such a blessing for you. But fast forward, I saw that they gave you the key to the city in New Orleans. What was that experience like for you, knowing everything that you know your family's been through in that city to what you went through to now and getting that key to the city? It, I mean, it's just a, it's it's a blessing, it's an honor to get the key to the city. You know, it's a lot of you know, it's only a few people in history got the key to the city, and just for me to even be one, man, that's as you know, it, it's is. It's just a it's a great feeling. If you'd have told me when I was, you know, 12, 13, 14 that man, you'll get the key to the city one day. You know what? I probably would believe myself. I would say I wouldn't believe, but I probably would have believed myself because one thing I always had as a, as a child was a belief. I always I just maybe it's a cockiness, maybe it's a belief, but I have that in me that like I always believed that I used to look um so one person I always look up to is like Lil Wayne. And, and it's because I used to see Lil Wayne coming up. Like, he used to be around mm. the corner from my house when he was, you know, lit, like, hot boy Lil Wayne and stuff like that. And I used to see him when he was, um, you know, when he was, like, a teenager and stuff. And I remember he used to drive Ferraris and stuff like that to high school. And I was like, you know what? I'm going I'm to be like that one day. And um, it, it just – when you see that, um, it just does something in your mind. Like, I can do that too. And it's the same thing that happened here when I – when I got to Houston, I went to a boxing gym, Savannah Boxing Gym, and you know it was Juan Diaz at the time. He was you know undefeated, um, lightweight champion, three-time lightweight champion. Mm. Um, you have Irisline De Laura, Ricky Diaw, um, Holyfield was there. Shane Mosley came in the gym. Oscar De La Hoya came in the gym. Mm. You seeing all these people, it's just like you have. I mean, these are mega stars, especially in boxing. And um, you, you you look at these people and it's just like, man, like you think like I could do this too. Especially you start sizing them up. You know, you start seeing these people. You're like, he the same size as me. You know, you look at Oscar, <laughs> you look at Shane Mosley, you look at like, damn, they the same. They did all this stuff, you know, because on TV, they look, they're larger than life. You know, they make hundreds of millions of dollars and, you know, they just so big in your eyes. But then you see them in person and it's just, it does something. It really does something to you. It, it does something to your mindset for sure. You know, that's what happened to me. I, I mean, I, then I, I just really, you know, that belief in myself. I, I always believed in, believed in myself since I was young. But then once I got here and I really saw that, then it just, it went even higher. And then, you know, the Charlo twins, that's like my brothers. You know, I was with, matter of fact, I was with Maul last night. And, you know, they made it. And it was like, that belief even got even higher, you know. So, so yeah. So as you're ascending and doing all that i wanted to know even before like what eventually led you into boxing as you're you know going through everything that you've told us about like even as a child and mm -hmm. was it something that like this is my way out or i'm really good at this i should pursue this because this is my best option or like what is it that kept you into boxing and was it just like you were saying you know watching the people around you sort of reach these heights that you were like hey i can do that too you know mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was both. It was like, it was like my way out. Like one thing I, I always want, I'm not gonna lie, I always wanted to be rich when I was younger. You know, I used to hear Facts. my, <laughs> like, I always wanted to be rich, bro. I'm not gonna lie. Like I, I used to hear my mama always say, you know, 
I can't afford this. I can't afford this. And I was, I used to hate it. Like I, I, I'm talking, I used to hate it. Like, man, yep. she's, I can't afford this. And I can't afford this. And this cost this and this cost this. And I couldn't stand it. Like I really, I just, I hated it, you know? And, um, and then coming to find out though, like we wasn't even that poor. Like my, I talked to my dad and me and my dad is cool now. And I talked to him about things when we was younger. He said, listen, we wasn't poor. You know, but it was just a mismanagement of funds, basically. And I'm not mm. I'm not gonna say who to blame for that, but you know, it was a mismanagement of funds. We wasn't poor though, you know. But I used to hear people like my 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 mama and just my cousins and my grandma, like, oh, that's too high, and I can't afford that. And I was just like, I hated that. I didn't want to be like that. And I used to look at rich people and like that's what I wanted to be. So when I was younger, I always knew, like, like I said, when I was younger, I saw Lil Wayne, I saw his his success, and I was like, all right. I'm going I'm to do that some type of way, but I'm not an artist or nothing like that. I'm an athlete. So I played every sport. You know, I did karate. First off, I did I, I did karate, like soccer. I, could, I did karate. I did football, basketball. I ran track. I, I swam a little bit, you know, but boxing was just different, you know. But I did all those things. And when I did all those things, that was, for me, that was my way out. I wanted to play football. I wanted to be a running back. Um, I wanted to play basketball. I used to want to be like Allen Iverson, you know. But, you know, boxing yeah. was like, like, it was just like this is it because i quit it i literally quit everything it's just none of that stuff wasn't for, i was real good at that stuff when i was younger but then you get older especially in football you you get you get older in football and these dudes are they they get bigger they get stronger and my, my body size <laughs> yeah. is only gonna get i can get stronger and i was getting faster but you know as far as bigger i wasn't gonna you know i'm only gonna get a certain size and um you know i, I took that in consideration but then boxing was just like I just loved it. Like once I started boxing, I just loved it. And I, I was always rough growing up. You know, that's the thing. I at first it was my younger sister. I got a sister two years younger than me. And me and her used to fight all the time. Then it was like cousins, <laughs> and then it was friends. And yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. It, and so, you know, it was cousins and friends and stuff. And then um, you know, then street fights. And I, I found out I was good at fighting. I just was I just was good at fighting. And then, you know, we started we started getting boxing gloves. We used to go to Walmart and get these little boxing gloves and stuff. And then we used to just go in the neighborhood with the gloves and, you know, fight, just fight in the neighborhood. And I was just good at it. And um, one day, how really, one of my, one of the story, one of the, one of my thoughts is that I played football, I played football in high school and all the football players used to fight. They used to get in the gloves, they used to fight in the boxing gloves and stuff. And um, like, one day I went in the, I went in the gym. Well, it was like a classroom we used to do at lunchtime. And one day I went in there and they had a dude on they we knocked on the door and everything got quiet. Everything got real quiet. And it was me and my friends. And so they opened the door. It was like a little peep. It was like a little peep in. And so when they opened the door, they was like, look, y'all can't come. If y'all not gonna fight, y'all can't come in. So hmm. all my friends walked off. Like literally <laughs> all of them. It was, it was like six of us. Yeah. Like all my friends walked off. And um, because we was like, I was a, I was a sophomore at the time, so it was like, it was like cool sophomores and juniors and seniors in a classroom, you know. But that was during lunchtime. It girls, pretty cheerleaders, dance team girls, all that type of stuff. Right. And so you know, one of my one of my friends at the time, he looked at me, and they had a dude. They already had a, they had somebody in the middle of. They made like a little ring out of chairs and stuff like that. They had somebody already in the middle with gloves on. And so hmm. the dude, one of my friends, he looked at me. And he just gave me that not he gave me that look like like all right it's me it's my turn and so i, I was like shit i fight him and so <laughs> i went and i fought the dude and i whooped him i mean i, I like i yeah i whooped him bad and so and this dude was he was like before that he was beating people up and i just i, I like i totally just whooped him bad and so then people were like damn we just know how to fight like really really know how to fight right and so then after that um, I did that. I did that a few times. You know, I went in that class where people wanted to see me fight. I was just whooping people. And so one time the coach came, the coach watched me, one of the football coaches, he watched me. And he said, he saw me fight. <laughs> and he said, listen, he said, listen, because yeah, New Orleans is corrupt. So the coaches was in there while we was fighting and all that. Stuff. <laughs> I, 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 I was going to say, yeah. they, let, they let you guys scrap it out. Like they were just like, they let go, us go fight. Yeah, they let us fight. Okay. It was corrupt. Yeah, New Orleans is corrupt. It's a, it's a city that anything goes. So, yeah. you know, anyways, the, the coach saw me and he said, the, the football coach, he said, listen, he, after the fight, he pulled me to the side. He said, listen, I, you know, you probably don't have a future in football, but you might have one in boxing. And at that time, I was thinking of that anyway. I was I didn't want to do football. No more. I was just I was just playing football just to just to do it basically. You know, I, I didn't want to do that no more. 
Um, and so literally, I think my the next week, next day, whatever it was, I turned in my football equipment, I quit, and I went to a boxing gym. And, you know, that was during the school, that was my 10th grade year, and during the school year. And so after, and the first, I remember my first time being in a boxing gym, it was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Now, mm. I don't know what the, I'm, I can't even remember what the coaches made me do at that time, but it was extremely, extremely hard. Like, I can't even think of what they made me do this time right now, but it was really hard. And I was, man, I was dead after those, like, first week. And so after that, my grade started going down. My mama, my, so my mama pulled me out. She said, wait till the summertime. So then the summertime came. This is my 10th grade year. The summertime came. And then um I then I went to a different boxing gym in a in a lower night wall in New Orleans. And then after that, um, Hurricane Katrina hit. And um I stopped, I had to stop for a long time, but I still had that desire to do it because I know I, that's what I want to do. So even when, even when like I wasn't at a boxing gym, even when I wasn't boxing. I would like I would be shadow boxing, punching stuff, getting I would buy a punching bag just to punch it every night. And then after that, you know, I moved I moved to a few different a bunch of different cities. And I eventually I I, I came back to Houston and um I stayed here. I went to Savannah Boxing Gym and that been it. So, you know, when did you realize like, hey, I'm gonna be able to do this professionally and I'm gonna be successful at it? Like, what was that moment when you realized like I could do this, get money, have a great life, and you know, be whooping everybody's ass on television. Like, when did you realize that moment, Regis? Well, so when I was an amateur, all right. So I'm gonna tell you how my my career started at, at Savannah's boxing gym. So when I first went to Savannah's boxing gym, I was a novice. So I didn't like basically. I had like it was like I had no fights. I actually had like one or two fights in New Orleans before that when I started boxing out there. But it was like I had no fights. So they put me in the ring with people that was just like me, you know, like no fights and stuff like that. And I spar with somebody and I hurt them bad. Like, I mean, I messed them up real. I hurt them real bad. Cause I was a raw, when I was an amateur, I was a raw street fighter. So mm. I really, I was just like a, just, just like I said, a street fight in the ring. So I had a lot of power, but I didn't have no finesse to it. So I heard a dude bad. So the coach pulled me out. He said, no, 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 no. And so after that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was like, no, you can't spar with them no more. You know, people, your people, your of your skill set, you can't spar with them. You gotta, you gotta go higher. So right. after that, I they had to put me in there with the with people going to nationals and stuff like that. So I was with the twins, we, me and Mel and Maul, and then you know all these dudes going to nationals: Hyler Williams Jr., Omar Henry. I was sparring with these guys, and so that would made me go to the the next level because automatically from a from having no fights. To, to spar with people that's going national at the time when I first got in the gym I think Mel was going to some type of nationals or something like that Maul was going to some type of nationals you know Highland Warriors was like a five-time three four-time whatever he was national champion so I'm around these are my friends and I'm around them I'm sparring with them so um that's what and I was like you know I can that's when I was like man I can do this but then what made me like I said the confidence grew over time over time being around all the world champions at the time um, being around Maryland Mall because they, you know, they started making money before me. And then when I was and when I was still amateur, so I was like a top amateur. I went to, I won, you know, I won state. I went to nationals. I went to Olympic trials, all that type of stuff. And then when I was, when I, but even before all that stuff, I was spawned with some pros that was fighting on Showbox. And I mean, I'm whooping them. I'm dogging them. And these mm. are dudes that's fighting on TV making, at the time, you know, these dudes making $20,000. At the time, for me, $20,000 was like $20 million for me. Facts. So, yeah. you know, um, so I was like, damn, I could, I, could, I could do this too. And, you know, my confidence just kept growing and kept growing and kept growing. After my, then after my first pro fight, it just, you know, my confidence just kept growing and growing and growing. And, you know, now I'm here. And now, now you being here leads uh, us to the present, right? And it seems like even today and throughout the course of your career, because I remember first hearing about you years ago. This is when I would be like at Barclay Center. This is like years before COVID or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And people would talk about, you know, Regis Prograde, he knocked out somebody in the second round. And I like, damn, this dude must be nice. Keep hearing about him, whatever the case may be. And then started seeing you on TV a lot. Showbox, as you mentioned, I forgot who it was you knocked out in like the second round, but it was another dude with an undefeated record at the time. It was like 2016, 17-ish. But Joe Diaz. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, it was that fight. And it feels like since then you've been avoided <laughs> more than just about anybody else in and around your weight class. 
Have you felt mm-hmm. that way? Because I feel like the, the way your career has played out, it's been almost difficult for you to get fights that like, oh, why, why don't other guys who are at that level want to fight him, say for like the World Boxing Super Series, for example? Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I just been avoided, man. I mean, I had like I had a hard road that I really had a hard road. People don't really realize how hard of a road I had. I still have a hard road right now. You know, Um, for me, I just look at it is what it is. But yeah, I, I, because people know like when they fight me, like I'm coming to fight like I, you know, I train really hard and I'm really, really hungry. So, you know, you come in to fight me, win, lose or draw. I'm going to mess you up no matter what. You know you, you're going to be in for a fight no matter what what's going to happen. You know you're going to be in for a fight messing with me. You know, so yeah, people been, you know, people been avoiding me for a long time. I'm just like for me, I'm just glad that you know I'm a world champion again. I got the I got the um the call to fight for a belt to, you know, to do that again and become a world champion because listen, if I if I wasn't a cha- right now people saying my name, you know, a lot of people saying my name and stuff right now, but you know, if I wasn't the world champion, nobody, nobody will say nothing at all. We like, were just they saying begging that. People yeah. to fight me. <laughs> Man, they was begging people like people did not want to fight me. It, it, like I couldn't. It was like a, you know, I, I just couldn't. I couldn't get no fights and stuff like that. So I'm just I'm so glad that I'm a world champion again now. You know, I, I have more value to my name and now I can get the big fights. And I just want to show people that I am the best. That's why I do it. I, I do it. Just I, I want to say I'm number one. You know, I was. Um, back in 2017, 2018, 2019, I was number one in the world. You know, I used to, I used to have pride and I opened the ring magazine and number one, number one, you know, I got issues of, you know, they all back here, number one. And now I'm back that spot, you know, but for three years I wasn't in that spot. And so I'm just like, that's what I do it for. Just, you know, I, you know, the money is, is cool. That's good and stuff like that. But I mean, I know how to make money outside the ring anyway, but I, I just, I, I want to be the best. And of course, being the best, like usually you want to fight the best as well. And I think everyone knows in the 140 pound division that you are that dude. That's why they keep saying your name. It's interesting because we had um, mm-hmm. Arnold Barbosa Jr. on the show not too long ago. He was mad respectful, talked about how great of a fighter you were. But he also said that he wanted right. to fight you. Like, what are your thoughts on a fight against Arnold Barbosa Jr. and, you know, just other guys in the division calling you out? And to, and to be clear, Regis, before you answer that, uh, Arno, we asked Arno Barbosa, who does he want next? And you were the first name he said, while also offering respect and things of that nature. It was you first. Right, right, right. That's cool. I mean, listen, I, I think he, you know, I, I think I think he's a good fighter. You know, I, I don't think he's on my level. Not yet. I don't think he's on that level yet, you know. But I, I, I was, listen, I respect him. Um, I fight, for me, listen, I want to, I fight any, I really will fight anybody. Whoever you put in front of me, I'm not playing. I'm not I'm not hiding behind, you know, a belt like most people do. Most people get a belt and just, you know, they want to take easy fights and hide behind belts. I, I don't want to do that. Like I want to, you know, I want, I want to, I want a good career. I want a Hall of Fame career. You don't get a Hall of Fame career by, you know, just taking easy fights. You know, I want to. I feel like I train hard when I'm in training camp. Like, listen, people, you know, it's not gonna be many people that's gonna outwork me when I'm in training camp. Out, just out grind me and you know, just have that grit like I have. So. For me, I want the, I, I do. I want the best fights that you know. I I just want the I want the biggest names. I want the best fights. How do you feel about a guy like you know Teofimo Lopez Jr.? We saw like the back and forth on you know social media, and he talked about you know you not fighting in the country, but we we all know that fight um, was in the states. Your last fight, like, what are your thoughts about him saying that? And do you think that fight with Teofimo Lopez will ever get made? You know, of course, after he fights possibly Josh Taylor, and if he does. <coughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm open to that fight too. You know, I'm definitely open to that fight. I mean, I think Tio, you know, Tio talk all that stuff, and then his daddy was like, "No, the fight ain't gonna happen." You know, they knew that. Look, the thing is, how boxing work is. This is how boxing work. People, they're gonna call a fight that they know is not gonna happen. So they gonna they gonna talk all the stuff. Ah, I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll do this. And then they know the fight not gonna happen next. You know, so that's why they're saying that stuff. You know, that's why. But for me, I don't. I don't really like. That's like me saying. That's the that's the prime example of me saying, man, I'm a I'm gonna fight Errol Spence. I'm gonna fight Crawford next. I know I'm not gonna fight them. I'm, I'm a forty pounder, right? So I know, you know, just hypothetically, I know I'm not gonna fight them. So that's what these dudes are doing. That's what they do. They they say, oh, I'm gonna fight him. I, I'm a whoop him. I'm a whoop him. But they know they fight somebody else. And a lot of times, I mean, I know the media might not know, but the, a lot of times the fighters they know they know who they already know who they fight next. They know you're not getting in line for this person. Like Tio knows he he wasn't fighting me next. Tio knows that. 
So that's, of course, he's going to say that. He's going to say all these things. The same thing, y'all might bring it up, Sabrina Matias. He knows he's not going to fight me right now. So he's going to talk and talk and talk. His people going to say all kinds of stuff. But, you know, hopefully he keeps that belt. And when it's time, and, and you know, when it's, when it's that time, I want all the people to say the same thing. I want them to keep that, for me, keep that same energy. When y'all know the fight going to happen. I'm going to see if he's going to keep that same energy when, when he knows the fight going to happen. And they, if they know the fight going to happen, yeah, it's easy to say, oh, I'm going to whoop him, I'm going to whoop him. Because you know the fight not going to happen. That's like the, that's like the, the dog behind the gate, you know, they're gonna keep barking and keep barking and keep barking because they know that gate is right, right there. But when that gate is opened up, I want to see if they're gonna keep barking. So we'll see. So we've talked about guys that you're probably not, or they probably don't want to see you in the ring right now. I guess that would be fair to say. But is there like who realistically do you think is next for you at this point? Or or if you could roadmap, like, here's what my 2023 is gonna look like. Who are actually the guys that you think will step in the ring with you at this point? Honestly, bro, I don't know. I don't know how the boxing game work. It's so political. It's so it's so much yeah. uh, focus on business, and it's so political. I don't. I don't. Honestly, I don't know. You know, I think that you know who I would want to fight is, of course, Josh Taylor. Um, right. I definitely want to fight him. Um, I think a big fight is is me and Teal. I think Ramirez. I think Matias. I think Jack Catterall. I think all those are all, all those are big fights. But you know, for me, I don't know. You know, I don't even know what I should do. Is if I should if I should go for undisputed right now and grab all the belts or should I just go for the big fights right now? You know, because I, I don't know if, if I grab all the belts right now, I don't know how motivated I'll be, you know? So I think right now, grab get the big fights. I think right now I get a lot of big fights and, and big fights don't have to be for the belts. You know, like a, I think a big fight is me and Jack Catterall. That's a big fight. Me and Adrian Broner. I think that's a big mm -hmm. fight. Me and either Ryan Garcia or Javante Davis. That those are big fights. Um, none of those dudes have belts, you know, and those are all, you know, all big fights. Tia Fimo, if he, you know, even if he loses to Josh Taylor, I think that'll still be a big fight. Ramirez, that's a big fight. He doesn't have a belt. So I think, you know, I think all those are big fights, but um, I, like I said, man, I don't, I don't even know my next move. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. You mentioned big fights is if there were an opportunity at welterweight, is that something you would pursue if it was a big enough name, money opportunity, big fight? Oh, everything is everything is a conversation. Yeah, everything is. I think everything is a conversation. I just think it's it's just bigger right now. I think it's just bigger at one forty. Like you know, I'm I'm glad I stayed at one forty because is you know I saw this years ago. People was like, man, you got moved to you have to move to one forty seven. I'm like, bro, I'm not moving up to one forty seven. <laughs> I saw it. I saw this. You know, I saw this years ago. Like all these guys at one thirty five, all of the big names, they all coming up to one forty. And then you still have people at 140. So the division, I mean, I can name 10 people off the top of my head right now that's, you know, that can, that's big fights. That's big money fights. So at 47, I mean, you got two people, you know, two up maybe, you know, maybe boots, three people. But at, at 140, you, you got like 10. So I think the best move for me is to stay at 140. Yeah, it's a it's a stacked division. Now, you kind of mentioned two guys that have a really big fight coming up, Ryan Garcia and Tank Davis. Obviously, you know, Tank has fought at 140 before, but how do you actually see that fight going between Tank and um, Ryan Garcia? I got Tank. I'm not going to I got Tank by, I think I got Tank by stoppage. Mm. Yeah. Early, late? Like, what, I think, what range? I, think tank goes. I, 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 I would never pick the rounds. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just think that I think Tank will stop him. You know, it'd probably be in the later rounds. I don't think the early rounds is not like that. I think Tank will stop him. Um... What I see in what I see in Ryan Garcia is confidence, but um, I think false confidence. You know, I think like, yeah, I think he sees. I think it's real confident. You have to be confident, but you have to have that certain level of confidence. I think it's, I don't know, it's just something I see about him. Maybe maybe I'm reading it wrong, or maybe I'm reading it right. But I think I see false confidence in Ryan. And with Tank, I think I see real confidence. Like he knows what's going to happen, and um. And Tank is skilled too. At the same time, Tank is very a very very skilled fighter. He's not just a a big puncher like people will say. He's actually like super skilled. He's very skilled, and um, I think even more skilled than than Ryan Garcia. And he's a and he's a big puncher. So, um, for me, I think I think Tank will probably stop Ryan. And so you know, you talked about him being a big puncher and how he's also really skilled. And you mentioned like you're you're down to fight anybody. You know what I mean? Like you want the smoke and you're confident in that. How would you feel about a fight with you and Tank and how that would go? 
I love that fight. Yeah. I, I love that. I've been me and me and Tank been going at it for you know what I'm saying we've been we went back and forth on social media a couple of times, you know. But I definitely listen, I definitely love that fight, you know. Um I hope that fight can happen one day. You know, if he if he if he beats Ryan, which I think he would, you know, um maybe he comes to you know 140 and you know tries to fight for a belt. But I think that'll be a I think that'll be a real big fight. It'll be a huge fight. So, you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah, it's a massive fight. And I want to stick with 140 because like Brian and I have always talked about how you're the best at 140. Like we have like debates about the rankings and we always stack you on top. But it's crazy because when you talk to a boxing fan that's I guess a casual boxing fan and you talk about 140 like they always talk about like Teofimo Lopez or you know um Jose Ramirez and sometimes your name is like left out of there and it's crazy to us because you're arguably the best mm -hmm. in the division like how does that make you feel and does that motivate you more to kind of go out there and just like whoop everyone's ass <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure for sure for sure yeah it's just it, it makes me you know it's the chip on the shoulder type of thing you know I know I'm not as popular as I should be and uh, maybe it's my fault. Maybe it's the promotion fault. You know, like something I really, something I really never really had too much as a like a you know a big promoter. You know, to really promote me. I just think like if I had, if I had a, um, if I I don't want to say no names, but if I had a, a big promoter that really promoted me, like if you look at if you look at my last my my fights, like I fought real good competition. I fought like I fought a bunch of like how many you have to ask yourself how many people are fighting these days that. You don't know who the winner's gonna be. It's a 50-50 fight, you know. And I destroyed these people, you know. Like it, it was, it was supposed to be like that with um with Abel. I fought Abel Ramos on Showbox. Abel Ramos was supposed to not. It was supposed to be 50-50. Abel Ramos was supposed to whoop me. Mm. He was supposed to beat me. I dismantled. I, I whooped him. I destroyed him. Joe Diaz. It was a 50-50 fight. Joe Diaz. They thought he was gonna whoop me. Yeah. Same thing. Destroy him in two rounds. You know, Jose Jose Zapata. It was a 50-50. Yeah. You know, people thought Zapata was gonna knock me out. Beat him, you know. Undang, I won't say Undango too much, you know. They got Terry Flanagan, he's in there, but I won't say it's 50 50. Undango, Relic, you know, those guys too. You know, I, I like you gotta look at my resume, like I beat a lot of really good fighters, you know. But it's just, you know, people don't know about it, it don't, it, you know, it is what it is. But for me, it just, I just, it just keep a chip on my shoulder. That's all. I just keep a chip on my shoulder and um, just keep grinding, keep grinding because, um, I, I like. You know, obviously you want to be you want to be popular, you want to be famous, but I don't do it for that. I really, I really love boxing. Like I really do. I like I study boxing, I love it, I read about it. Um, I train every single day, fight or no fight, I'm training, I'm training to get better. So um I, I think that you know everything it everything is gonna work out the way it's supposed to. Is that level of uh before we wrap things up here, uh is that level of fame and promo something you want before? you know, whenever the day comes where you decide to hang it up? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, like, I compare myself with somebody like a Marvin Hagler. You mm. know, he didn't get his – he didn't get his recognition for so, so long. You know, he had to have – he had to have the fight, really the fight with Tommy Hearns, really to boost his career. And I think I'm going to have that. I really think I'm going to have that one day. It might – it's going to be somebody that's, you know, a huge name. It might be like a Tank. It might be a Ryan. It might be a – you know, somebody with a big name in that, you know, I just dismantle and then they're gonna be like, then it's is I think that's when it's gonna come, hmm. you know. So hey, I'm 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 not, you know, for me I I'm not worried. I do it for the I don't do it for the fame. I do it because I love the sport. I, I do like that Marvin Hagler comparison a lot. Though. Yes. I, that, that that when you say that, I feel like that makes a ton of sense when you think about it. Right. So, mm -hmm. so I have like one more question actually before we head to the mandatory maze because, like, we talked about you being like underrated, which is crazy because you're a champion. But I feel like there's guys from the Houston era area that are still underrated. Like Mel is undisputed, but sometimes people leave him off like the pound for pound list, right? And it's like, how 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 that how do you leave him off of that list? And then you, of course, it's like we know yet yeah, you're the best at 140. Like, what do you think it is about you guys from the Houston era not getting the credit that is due to you guys? I think it's just a popularity type of thing. It's a popularity contest. You know, I know male and male not too popular, you know, because of, I think it's more um, their personalities, you know, how people look at them. I think with me, I'm just not as flashy as as I should be, you know, um, I think I do have the, the personality and stuff like that, but I'm just not a, I'm not a flashy person or nothing, you know, like, you know, I don't walk around with diamonds all the time. I do a lot of, 
I guess, regular people stuff, you know, then, you know, and that's, that's what I enjoy. I'm not, I don't walk around with, you know, security and paparazzi and all that stuff. I like, I go to the you know, store with my kids. Like yeah. people see me out and they're amazed at that. Like I go, <laughs> I go to a store and be like, people like, they'll look and like, I, I actually, I went, I went somewhere last night and somebody was looking at me and I feel, I feel strange when people just look at me. Somebody was just looking, just looking, staring at me. And I, I looked at him for a second and I just stared away. And then the person just came up to me like, you, you read this program. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, read, you know, you read this program. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and people get, they get amazed. Like, like the boxing people, they get amazed when they see me out, you know, doing regular stuff. I go to, the, you know, I go to play places with my kids and stuff like that. And I don't know, it just feels, for me, it just, it'll feel funny and stuff. Like when people... When people notice me and all that, it feels like kind of, I don't know, it, it feels kind of funny. Because at the end of the day, I'm still a regular person, just like everybody else is. I'm still a regular person. I still do regular people stuff. I still take my kids out. I still go to the movies and all. You know, I still do things like that. And, um, but, you know, that's just, that's just how it is. All right, let's get you over to the mandatory maze. So what this is, Regis, is we're going to ask you a couple of questions and you got to go with the first thing that comes to your mind. So I'm actually going to start this off. Let's talk about New Orleans hip hop for a little bit because we're almost about the same age. So growing up, Master P and No Limit was like massive. Did you bump them a little bit more than cash money growing up, like during that time? <laughs> I'm cash. I'm more cash. Look, I know Master P. I know I know Lil Wayne and them, but I'm 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 a I'll Lil Wayne my favorite rapper of all time. So I'm you know, I'm more cash money than, than Master P for sure. But we, we bumped all of them, but I I'm more um I'm definitely more um the, the cash money for sure. All right, favorite Lil Wayne album. Uh, that's hard, man. It probably either the probably like the Carter two, the Carter yeah, one or Carter, Carter two. two. Solid. But, yeah, yeah. but really yeah, the, the Carter one or Carter two, but really his mixtapes. Lil Wayne got crazy. Yeah. Like when I was in when I was in high school. <laughs> dedication, like, yeah. We used to yeah, all the dedications that we used to like, bro. That's when my partners used to burn CDs and just sell them at the school. That's what we used <laughs> to do. So all the dedication albums, all that stuff, like sorry for the weights, all that stuff that you know, but um album, it's probably like the Carter one or Carter two. Carter two for me also. Um, biggest misconception about New Orleans that people just get wrong that aren't from there. Man, that's a um, that's a that's a good question. I think <laughs> it, it all right. This is a misconception, but it's actually true. It's both. So <laughs> it's how dangerous the, it's how dangerous the city is. You know, I think a lot of people are scared of going to New Orleans, and it's very all right. It's very dangerous, but not too much for the tourists. You know, it's more, okay. it's more for like the locals and you know all that type of stuff. And um, yeah, and like and going on like Bourbon Street and stuff like that's a lot of locals don't really do that. You know, like the the tourists kind of do that because I I went out there, I was just in New Orleans like last week, and I was like, man, let's go to Bourbon. And all my partners were like, bro, we don't go to Bourbon. What you talking about? I'm like, I don't like I live in Texas. Like they're like, bro, you from here? What you doing? Why would you want to go on Bourbon Street? Like you live in. <laughs> Yeah. I'm like, bro, I still live in Texas, too. I'm still like a tourist. They're like, bro, you not a tourist. You live here, too. You from here. You live here, too. You just in Texas most of the time. So I was like, all right. <laughs> but yeah. Now, Chantel and I cover other sports as well. You're Are you a fan of all the New Orleans teams, like the Saints, everybody else? I am, but I'm not into it too much. I'm not going to lie. I am. I'm definitely, you know, Saints fan, definitely Pelicans. But I, I like if you ask me, like, the players and all that, like, I wouldn't. Oh, <laughs> I would not <laughs> I was gonna ask about how you felt about the Saints signing Derek Carr to a big contract. Your it's new a good thing, but yeah, I, I, don't, I, you know. I can't even answer that. One. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't even. I can't even answer that. I, I used to. I, I mean, I like it. I like it when um, I like I will for me like the Saints when the Saints play and stuff like that. That's it's like a it's like a thing in New Orleans we do, you know, like we eat crawfish, we get seafood and we watch the Saints game. That's like something, you know, that's like something we do out there. It's like a it's a social thing. But um, you know, if I'm out here in Texas and stuff, you know, if I don't if I'm if nobody around me or nothing, like I, if nobody trying to eat crawfish and stuff, I'm not gonna just watch the Saints by myself. You know, my grandma okay. that's how they was. They'll just they just you know, they'll just watch the Saints and you know, it could be every Sunday they're gonna watch the Saints, but for me, like nah, I don't I'm not gonna sit. I, don't, I barely watch TV too much, so I'm not gonna sit in front of the, um, you know, and watch a four-hour game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna let you know though, because 
that your quarterback came from my team that you guys are gonna possibly go all the way this year. I'm just gonna let you know. So oh yeah, I thought, I thought you, I thought you didn't right. like Derek. Carr, no, I, right? I I I like Derek. Like he's gonna ball out. It's gonna be like that thing where you when well we won't talk about sports, but you guys are gonna be really <laughs> you guys are gonna be really good this upcoming year. Trust me on that. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Cool, I, cool, this cool. is kind of my final thing for you because I know that you kick it in Brazil a lot. What's your favorite thing to do out there? In New Orleans. In in Brazil. In Brazil. Oh, in Brazil, in Brazil. Oh, man, I, I like going to the, the Bailey. Look at the, the hat, favela, say favela. Um, okay. I like going to the, I love going to the Bailey's in favela. I like that a lot. It's like, I don't know if you've ever been there, if you ever heard of it, but it's like a big street party. And okay. it's real dangerous, but <laughs> um, I still, it's real dangerous, but I still like to do it. Um, it's no police going there. Police don't even go in there. It's it's like a big, big street party. The only thing I can compare that to is is Mardi Gras. Like how many people yeah. it is. Like it's like jam. It's like this. It's like literally you walk in like side by side. It's like it's that many people. And <laughs> um, and what they do is just like it's full of it's full of everything, like drugs and all. It's just like. <laughs> All that stuff, but it's really, really dangerous to go to. But if you don't get into nothing, then you'll be okay. And it's just music playing. Like the speakers are huge, and I, I just I I like going to that stuff too. That's one of my I think one of my favorite. I, it's a lot of things I do out there, but that's one of my favorite things. Okay, my last question: uh, If you could fight any legend in their prime, who would they? Roberto Duran. Okay, how and how would that fight go? I don't know, man. I can't listen. Uh, one thing I must say, listen. Um, so I, I, you know, I was I spent some time with Duran in New Orleans, and you know, this was this was like a dream come true. People, these they're gonna have fighters asking me about this, you know, for the rest of my life, right? Because they're gonna they have fighters that's gonna study study boxing. They're gonna you know study me. They're gonna study Duran, and you know. So they're gonna ask me about these things, and we so me and Duran went to a restaurant. We ate, yeah. and then after that we went to a boxing gym. And when we went to the like, Duran is like seventy something years old, old man, right? And yeah. so Duran walks with a limp. His he had to have a back surgery and all that stuff. And listen, when Duran got in the boxing gym, he 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 limped in the boxing gym, wobbled in the boxing gym, but when he put his hands up, it, it just it changed it like he was at home it literally like he was at wow. home like I, like i don't know if you saw the video of me him like kind of shadow sparring and stuff like that I we did some did. things yeah. in the yeah. man's hands the man's hands are still fast like wow. he still was like hit me and stuff like that i was like, oh my <laughs> God. like this man this is this will be crazy like just to learn from him and you know it, it was it, it was just an amazing experience just to get that from him and to learn from him um, and I tried to do some of that stuff in the ring, you know, when I got back home and start sparring, it just, it was amazing. And I, and, and we did a, we did a face off. And when I looked in his eyes, um, I remember Sugar Ray, Sugar Ray Linda say it was like looking in the devil's eyes. When I looked in his eyes, <laughs> it was, it was like that. Like it was, <laughs> it really was like that. Like he was a friendly old man telling all kinds of stories at the restaurant eating. And we had a, a bunch of fun, you know, just telling a lot of stories and stuff, but when he got to the boxing gym, it was like, it like he was home. Like it was, it really, it, it was like he was home. It was crazy. Yeah, that would be a crazy fight for a dream fight, actually, to see you guys right. in your prime to get it on like that. That's like a pay-per-view you wouldn't want to miss. But Regis, we've taken yeah. enough of your time. I just want to say thank you so much for rocking with us. Um, I know this was the You're second welcome. time around we tried to do this. So we really yeah. appreciate you, man. I just want to say like, I've talked to a bunch of athletes before and you got to be one of the most humble guys that I've ever talked to. So thank you so much. Oh, we sorry. really appreciate oh, it. And uh, shout out to Benji too, because he helped make this happen. So uh, thank you guys yep. so much and uh, all the best of luck for you throughout this year for whatever fights you have coming up. All right. Thank you.